to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Ah, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am only a child. But the Lord said to me, do not say, I am only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. May the Lord add blessing to the words from the book of Jeremiah this morning. <clears throat> you know, psychologists tell us that there's only one type of dream that's nearly universal. One type of dream that's almost all universal. It's the dream of being unprepared for an exam. Or a test. And it's awful. I mean, kids all over the world report having this dream. Or should I call it a nightmare? I don't know. Maybe it's a nightmare. In this dream, you realize on the day of the exam that you never showed up for class. You didn't go to one class. Or you, you missed the entire semester for some reason. Or the exam questions were written in a foreign language that you don't understand or you just completely forgot to study okay now our buddy Sigmund Freud the founder of psychoanalysis studied these exam dreams and concluded that they are never about the exams that we failed it's never that Freud discovered that these dreams usually involve exams in which we did well. So he believed that the exam uh, dreams were actually our brain's way of reassuring us that we faced this challenge before, we did well, and we could do it again. That's what Freud said. And I hope he's right. I don't think... I'm the only one who panics with the thought of facing a, a big challenge unprepared. Do you like to go into a challenge to work wherever you're going unprepared? It freaks me out. In our scripture today, Jeremiah is a young priest. I mean, he's wet behind the ears. He's probably in his mid-20s at this point. And he's living in a small settlement near Jerusalem, kind of like a Dunbar or a smock. You get, get my drift? That's, that's where he was living. Young kid. And one day, he's called to be a prophet to the nations. That's a big deal. Well, there's nothing really scary about that, right? Don't kid yourself. Any young pastor who has ever gone to their first pastorate, their first time standing in a pulpit, knows that fear. Amen, pastors? <laughs> How many of us have ever thought or said to ourselves, if God would just speak to me, I mean, if he would just speak to me, if he would just tell me what I should do with my life. My, it would be so much easier, right? You've had thoughts like that. We all think that if God spoke to us in a very clear, unmistakable way, we would feel instant relief and we would obey instantly whatever he said, yes. But look at all the people that God spoke to in the Bible. I mean, very few responded with, Hey man, that sounds good. Yes, sir, re, I'm in. I'm in. Thank, tell me, thank you so much for making it very clear about what I'm supposed to do. You're the man. No. Almost every person responded with fear. And they had questions. And 
they had excuses. Mm -hmm. Excuses. So let's not kid ourselves about we are so faithful or courageous to respond to God's call uh, to, live, to fulfill our His His uh, purposes. You know, we think we are, but we probably are. Jeremiah responds like we probably would. Jeremiah says, Alas, sovereign Lord. Which is another way of saying, Oh no, 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 no. I don't know how to speak. I don't know how to get up in front of anybody. I'm too young. I can't do it. I, I, I got something else to do that day. No. Which seems very reasonable excuse to most of us. Yeah? I'm sure you meant to give this to somebody else. You're telling God that. I, I think you probably meant to give that to oh, Gary. Not me. How many times have you written um, an employee evaluation mark? You write them? Lots? Weird, huh? <laughs> you got to talk about somebody. One manager wrote an employee evaluation. He said, he's never very been very successful. When opportunity knocks, he complains about the noise. Don't say much about that guy. Jeremiah wasn't exactly complaining. He just wasn't listening, you see. All Jeremiah heard was the responsibility, what he had to do. He didn't hear the reassurance that God gave him. God never gives a responsibility without giving reassurance. God never calls someone without first comforting them. And God never appoints someone without first anointing them for that purpose. Look at God's words in the beginning of this passage. He said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. And I hope you hear these words just like Jeremiah did because your life will never have the impact God created for you to have unless you understand this very basic truth. God made you for a purpose. That's the first thing we need to understand from this story about Jeremiah. God made you for a purpose. In fact, God tells Jeremiah, before you were born, I set you apart. The word used here literally means set apart for a sacred purpose or a consecrated purpose. You weren't just made for a purpose. You were made for a sacred purpose. For God's purpose. How many of you recognize the name Dr. Robert Schuller? Crystal Cathedral? Yeah, a lot of books. I like to listen to him when he was live. And he said one time, he said that he prays one prayer every morning, the same prayer. And the prayer is, dear Lord, lead me to the person you want to speak to through my life today. He said that this simple prayer caused him to see the people around him as opportunities for God's blessing. He didn't assume that he had all the answers because he didn't. But the burden, you see, wasn't on him. He assumed that if he would do his part, God would work through him to bring some truth or some love or some mercy into that particular person's life that day. What would change in your life if you viewed every minute of your life as a limitless opportunity to live for God? Every minute, every waking hour. 
The time you spend in your daily commute going to and from work or to and from school. The conversations you may have when you're at, I don't know, how many go to the gym? Gym, in the locker room, in the conference room, in the, in, in the, on social media. And many, many people are on social media. What would those moments look like if you knew God was working through you to change people's lives? How would you, how would you go through that? What would you do? You remember Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. He told them, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ to do good works which were prepared in advance for us to do. Maybe he read the book of Jeremiah. Prepared in advance. God not only created us for good works, you see, but God prepared us for good works for us to do in advance. Already prepared. This is what Ed's going to do. This is what Dan's going to do. God didn't just make you for a purpose. God made you with a plan in mind. A plan for you to get something done. God made you li your life specific for specific good works that were prepared in advance for you to do. There is nothing random or meaningless about your life. Not one thing. Every minute was created for God's sacred purposes. That's the first thing we need to understand from today's scripture. And the second thing is that in order to accomplish God's purposes, we must live without fear. No fear. We can't have fear. Think what we could accomplish if we could live without fear. One of the rules of rock climbing, <clears throat> how many of you rock climb? Nobody. I thought that was a big thing in this church. <laughs> Anyhow, the, one of the first rules of rock climbing is never jump unless you can see where you're going to land. Pretty good. And before you climb to a higher peak, make sure you can see a way back down. Pretty good. That's great advice for rock climbers. But it's not great advice for followers of Jesus Christ. It's not. God says, jump and I'll catch you. God says, climb out on a higher peak and trust that I will show you the way. Listen to God's words to Jeremiah. He says, do not say, I am too young. You must go to who everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you to. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. How many opportunities are lost to fear? Well, I, I can't do that. No, 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 no. Particularly the fear of rejection. Nobody wants to be rejected. We just hate to be rejected. It's just something that we just can't seem to deal with. But you know what? I've never heard of anyone dying of rejection. How many blessings wither and die in the face of our excuses? We can excuse and excuse and excuse until it goes away. Fear shrinks our vision. Fear stunts our potential. Fear steals our eternal impact on life. How's that happen? By making us doubt God's calling. That's how it happens. He said, do not say, I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you to. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. He not only told Jeremiah that, 
but he's telling us that. A lady named Deborah Constance found success and stability as a vice president of a major realty company in Los Angeles, California. In her role as vice president, she was also in charge of her company's philanthropic giving. As a result, she made a passion, uh, had a passion for kids in disadvantaged, crime-ridden neighborhoods in South Central LA. Through her volunteer work with these kids, Deborah sensed that there was a larger mission that she had in her mind running through her and uh, a successful real estate business just wasn't catching it. So when she shared her growing conviction with a friend, he asked her, what do you really want to do with your life? And without thinking, she said, all I really want to do is open up a safe house for kids at Jefferson High School. And her friend said, then do it. Do it. And then the panic set in. See, she got panicky. And she, uh, she said uh, that she couldn't open up a safe house uh, because she herself dropped out of high school and she had to go back and do remedial stuff just to get a diploma. And, oh, hey, it would cost way too much. I, I couldn't come up with the capital. I can't do that. Uh, she didn't have the right education either. I mean, she wasn't really experienced. <clears throat> Deborah's friend listened. And then looked her in the eye and said, you can do it, and you must do it. That conversation led to founding of a community center named A Place Called Home that serves hundreds of young people every day in one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in Los Angeles. The workers there offer themselves, offer counseling uh, and academic tutoring and after school programs in the arts and various sports. They also provide college scholarships and job placement and safe hangout for kids who are still in their teenage years. Now, how many have been, how many lives have been changed and how many lives will be changed because Deborah Constant's friend challenged her with the words, you can do it. And you must do it. You see, to accomplish God's purposes, we must live without fear. Live without fear. And finally, we need to understand that in order to accomplish God's purposes, we must trust God's plan for our lives. Doing great things for God begins with a simple trust that God, the one who has called us will not forsake us and will seek to follow us all the way with anything that we do. He will be with us all the way. Now, the question is today, how many football fans do we have here? <laughs> That's the big question. Super Bowl's coming up. Got Two games today and in the Super Bowl. We got football fans. Um, I don't want to be accused of comparing God with a professional quarterback. But God loves throwing lead passes. The title of the sermon is God Loves Throwing Lead Passes, in case you were wondering where that came from. A lead pass in football is when the quarterback throws a long pass, not to where the receiver is at the time of the pass being thrown, but where the receiver will be when the ball gets there. The receiver runs ahead, goes way down the field, and then he trusts that the quarterback will throw the ball and it will be there when he's there, the quarterback throws a lead pass. 
With God, when you follow his principles, the results are almost always delayed, okay? Like when he asks you and me to do something. We rarely see the results of this thing immediately. We just don't see it immediately. We have to keep doing what we know he told us to do. What did he tell us to do? Well, in that analogy, it's the running. We're the runners. We're going out. And trusting that he will get the results. What's the results? It's the ball. He'll get the results somewhere downfield. And if I were playing catch with an NFL quarterback, any of them, and he said, just start running and the ball will be there when you get there, I would trust him. They're just that good. You think they're good? God's good. God is good. How much more can you we trust God when he says, just start running, Ed, and I'll take care of the rest. So whatever you are trusting him for today, and we all are trusting God for something today, right now as we sit here, just keep running and trust that he's got it all worked out. Because he does. That's what Jeremiah learned to do. I mean, God didn't choose Jeremiah because of his outstanding skills. He was a kid. He had no skills yet. And it wasn't about his charisma either. Look at the final verses of the passage. It says, Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. God's plan is not about you. And God's plan is not about me. It's about God working through us. As the Lord said to Jeremiah, I have put my words in your mouth. But God gives us a choice. What we give God back, he will use for his purposes. So what would happen if you gave everything you had to him? Everything. God made you for a sacred purpose. You know what? You can't unhear that because it's said here. You can't unhear it. God made you for a purpose. Every minute you are alive is a sacred opportunity to do good works. That God prepared in advance for you to do. The only obstacle standing between you and God's purposes is your willingness and my willingness. Will you give every part of your life to God in everything that you do? Will you refuse to let fear shrink, shrink your vision? God can use you to bring hope and salvation to people who might never meet him any other, one, uh, any other way but through you. There's somebody out there that will not know God unless you take him to them. We need to decide today to trust everything to God's purposes. And God will use us to make an eternal impact on others' lives. Amen? Amen. We all just got to remember that the Master walks with us every step of the way. No matter what, what road we go down, no matter whose path we're in, He's there with us. And all we have to do is surrender to that, and He'll do the rest. It's not a big, it's not a hard job. It's just, to be there and allow God to work through year. Oh, Master, let me walk with thee. He wants to walk with each and every one of us. So let that happen.
bow your heads with me in prayer. Lord God, we just thank you that we know that you are with us every step of the way. Help us to go through life knowing that we are there because you set us apart. Our mission was set before we were born. Help us to just allow you to guide us to the place where you would have us to be. Oh, Master, just let us walk with thee. Until we meet again, amen.